Let's talk about stress tonight. We're going to talk about stress primarily in the context of organizations and, and the workforce. And we'll talk about it from a, a perspective, let's say, of the social scientist, social behavioral scientist, or the manager administrator. We're not going to talk about stress in a clinical way here. So we're not going to be talking about uh, clinical interventions with regard to stress. We'll allude to some stress reduction techniques perhaps. But primarily we're going to be concerned with uh, what stress is, what are the basic dynamics of stress, what are uh, the stressors within organizations, and uh, what can organizations do about those kind of things to ameliorate this, the uh, level of stress that people have, prevent it, or respond to it in constructive ways, and then we'll be talking about burnout. We'll take a break and then we'll <coughs> close the class, we'll close the semester, I think, with an interesting kind of exercise. Um, there are a variety of, of definitions and theoretical approaches to stress. No one is necessarily better than the other. Uh, Hans Selye might be the most famous and the best known of all the researchers and theorists in the area of stress. And I remember reading at some point in time that this fellow, uh, now deceased, I think he had over 1,000 publications in the area of stress. Now, I'm, I'm, I am dripping with envy. I, I'm going to admit that. I think that's absolutely phenomenal, right? I'm not sure that there are a thousand new ideas that are embedded in those thousand articles, but that is the academic process. And, and let, I'm, you know, bow in the direction of Hans Selye. Let's start right there, okay? And Selye defines stress as the nonspecific response of a body to any demand made upon it. And that's going to be uh, important in terms of his perspective that we're going to be talking about in just a little bit. The general adaptation syndrome, you're probably already somewhat familiar with that as well. And so he's really talking about uh, a physiological response that also has a psychological dimension to it and the relationship of the organism to its environment. McGrath here talks about stress as an imbalance between environmental demands and a response capability of a focal organism. So if you think of this, you're thinking in terms of demands that the environment, physical or social, may be making upon an individual and the individual's perceived or real inability uh, or, or near exhaustion in terms of responding to that kind of demand. Hopful does something interesting. He approaches stress almost like an economist does. It's an economic model here. Where, where Hopful's talking about stress as a reaction to the environment in which there's a perceived threat of net loss of resources. All right? Actual net loss of resources or a lack of resource gain following investment of resources. And the fact is, Hopful's not really talking about what you're doing with your money. He's really talking about what you're doing with your energy. What are you doing with the hope that you have? What are you doing with the love that you invest and the trust that you invest in others? Right? What is it about the plan you have for your life and the energy and the dedication and the commitment that you've made to that life plan when you begin to realize that it's not going to pan out? or that the return that you thought you'd get for it, um, uh, loving relationships, uh, uh, a good, warm, and loving family, uh, money in the bank, um, you know, a house, nice car, great job, et cetera, don't appear to be likely based upon the plan that you'd work out for yourself. So all of those things that you put in to try to achieve those particular goals, those are the resources. Those are the resources that uh, Hoffel's alluding to. And all of those wonderful returns, all those wonderful achievements that you valued, that's the resource that's expected to be returned to you. So it's whenever there's a significant perceived or real imbalance in terms of the return for the investment that one has put into such a plan or the loss of those kind of resources that are available. That's, that's uh, stress as Hopfel understands it. 
Now, I want to draw the distinction between stress and a stressor because the term stress, just as there are many definitions, the stress can be thought of and under some definitions as a stimulus and under some definitions as a response. And for our purposes here, we're going to think of stress as the response. We're going to think of stressor as the stimulus. So under that kind of model, the stressor is, is anything that's, that's frequently environmental, uh, that is in reality or is perceived to be that which threatens the resource or the resource return, threatens or makes a demand upon the organism or requires some kind of adjustment. It's significant. The stress response then, to the extent that the response is stressful, represents the organism's uh, physiological and psychological and behavioral efforts at adapting and those kind of events that are correlates of that or that prepare the body for those kind of things. Now here I'm starting to, to drift into the general adaptation syndrome that Cellier was so important in helping identify. The general adaptation syndrome, according to this theory, is uh, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years old. It's part of our inheritance. It's part of our genetic package. So imagine yourself, homo habilis, walking along. I'll even make, we'll go back farther than that if you really like your physical anthropology, right? Your um, um, Australopithecus robustus, right? Just ambling along the African savanna, right? And all of a sudden, a great big <coughs> Tiger or something like that emerges, right? Godzilla, Mothra, that was on TV over the weekend, right? Uh, 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 all of a sudden emerges and starts to attack you, all right? Uh, what are you going to want to do? Fight or flight. Fight or flight. That's exactly right. That's right. That's right. And by the way, I give you credit for even thinking about fighting because if anything <laughs> like that comes up, right? You know, you're, if it's the two of us walking across that savanna, you're fighting alone. There's no, there's no choice on my part. I'm out of there, right? Fight or flight, that's the other kind of, uh, of nifty little uh, uh, title for this particular syndrome. So what happens if you're gonna fight? What happens if you're gonna flee? Cellier says, well, that's a choice that you make, but as far as your body is concerned, it really doesn't make that much difference. Because physiologically, the same kind of things <coughs> are happening if you're going to fight as they are uh, going on in your body if you're gonna flee. So digestion comes to a, a, you know, a, a halt. Any of you have experienced prolonged stress, know what it does to your appetite, knows what it does to your digestion, knows how, how you feel down there, right? Uh, their blood is, uh, flows differently in the body as uh, arteries constrict or maybe it's veins constrict. One of those things are constricting. Uh, uh, there's uh, adrenaline getting pumped out uh, into the uh, system, your body is being mobilized to meet what is perceived to be nothing short of a crisis. Your life depends upon this. So your ability to have almost superhuman strength under those kind of conditions, your ability to run awfully fast, awfully far, for awfully long, uh, uh, all conducive to survival. Yeah. Now. Let's go up the evolutionary chain. How many thousands and thousands of years and then we're no longer Australopithecus africanus, you know. We're right here at ETSU. And so you experience a crisis today. You've got the fight or flight syndrome. Chances are you're gonna do neither of those two things. Chances are you're not gonna punch somebody out. Chances are you're not gonna just turn around and run off on your heels as fast as you can, right? Chances are if it's a quiz, you're gonna have to sit there and take it right? And then you're going to stew about it. And if you don't know how you've done with a paper that you've submitted, and it's all over, but now you've got to wait for the grade, and it's important for you. Am I close? <coughs> right? Right? In some respects, your fight or flight response has been triggered. But there's no quick resolution. Okay, so you run a mile, right? Great. They're still here. You know, they'll be unread for a while. They'll be ungraded for a while. 
You know, or you've got a relationship problem at work. You don't like somebody. You may have all the right reasons in the world not to like that person, but that person may be your boss. Okay? And so they show up and they're obnoxious today and they're obnoxious tomorrow and they're obnoxious the day after that. And they provide recurring stressors in your life at work. Okay, go ahead, run. You know, don't hit. Don't hit. Rule out the fight part of it. But the chances are that the running doesn't do any good. You probably don't run anyway. You probably try and swallow it. You go into your office. You maul over it. You obsess on it. And what's happening in your body? What's happening in your body? Much of the same elements, all the same elements, just get dragged on and on and on without resolution. The general adaptation syndrome. Now, when we're starting to take a look at the biological events in the body that take place in a stress reaction, then we're also laying the foundation for understanding that long-term exposure to recurring stress can have serious, deleterious effects on the human body. You know, blood pressure, cholesterol, heart disease, tension headaches, chronic things like this. Now, Selye helps us to distinguish between stress, distress, and what he calls eustress. If it's true, and I'm going to argue it is, based upon mo mostly Selye's work, that a stressor is likely to, by definition, solicits or, uh, uh, elicits a stress reaction, then we can differentiate between distress and eustress in terms of how the individual perceives the event, how they value it. Now, the physiological stuff in the immediate situation remains the same. So you can have the sweating palms, the dry mouth, and this kind of stuff if you're getting married or if you're getting divorced. You know, you're, you might be in front of a judge either way, but one of them is a happy event and one of them is a sad event, right? <laughs> We're still in the happy event, aren't we? <laughs> Yeah, it could be reversed. And frequently it is, depending upon which party you are. <laughs> That's exactly right. You know, like having a baby might be a wonderful thing for some people, and it just might be a terrible thing for somebody else. It might be a wonderful thing for one person at that point in time in his or her life. Clearly, if I'm talking about the him, I'm talking about being party to the birth of the baby, right? Or it might be a terrible thing, a tragedy at another point in time in that person's life. Right? So... If it's experienced in a dystonic way, in a way that, that we, we would rather avoid and wish we could, then Sellier suggests we use the term distress to refer to that. If it's something that we think is exciting and, and enjoyable, you are voluntarily on the world's largest roller coaster. You're enjoying the heck out of the trip even though you're scared out of your wit's end, right? Well probably laughing all the way, you stress. But what's going on in the body? Same, same kind of thing. Now, where the difference between you stress and distress lies is in duration. <sighs> Unfortunately, happiness doesn't seem to have the same lifespan for any particular event that, that unhappiness does. Right. Um, people in object relations theory, Harry Guntrip, and others argue, for example, that happy experiences are incorporated into the self as memory. So whatever the kind of uh, uh, most immediate lifespan of the general adaptation syndrome is, that's how long the body is in that kind of reaction. And at that point in time, we're, we're, we're happy, the adaptation syndrome is over, we have a pleasant memory, we go on with our life. But when something bad happens to us, how long do we dwell on those things? And by the way, the answer to that one can be perhaps a lifetime. Perhaps a lifetime. Think of all of the energy, for example, that goes into walling off and trying to protect the psyche from some of the most <laughs> primitive and earliest assaults on it in terms of human development. Think about the energy that people put in to trying to rationalize or to deny 
or to somehow distance themselves or to somehow get on top of and understand the bad things that happen to them in life. You know? It could be the loss of a loved one. It could be the loss of an opportunity. Um, it could be a major, let's say, public insult that occurs that really, really humiliates and damages an individual's self-esteem and self-identity. How long will somebody obsess on that? And for the period of obsessing, you can imagine the emotional and physiological reactions being dragged out longer and longer and longer a period of time. So even though the general adaptation syndrome speaks to a constant, if you will, a, a, a set of physiological responses and reactions that occur as a result of a stressful situation, the impact, particularly as determined by duration, can be very significantly different based upon whether the experience is distress or eustress. Now, what I have here is a very basic element or a model of what we're talking about here. One of many that are out there, most considerably more complicated than this, but this one has most of the essential elements. You've got the stimulus. Oh, by the way, is something that's perceived as stressful to one person going to be perceived as stressful to others? No, not necessarily at all. Not necessarily, right? Now, we throw a rattlesnake in here. Chances are, chances are everybody's going to perceive that as a stressor, right? Chances are. If I tell you that I've got a garter snake in here, and wouldn't it be interesting if on the last day of the class, that just for this, no, it's just one of these, all right. But the fact is, had that been a garter snake, chances are for some of you it would have been a stressor. And for others, it wouldn't have been. It was going to fly. It wasn't really. See, this is the energy bar is for you. <laughs> all right. That's creative use of a visual aid, by the way. That's all. That's all that was. That's all that was. Right. Thanks for the story. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, only a few, you know. <laughs> the point here is, is that even perhaps talking about even just a little garter snake was stressful for some people. And for others, it would be like, wow. I was watching, uh, my wife and I were watching a rerun of Big Bang Theory just last night. Perhaps you've seen the episode where Sheldon's trying to get back at people and trying to scare them, you know. And so he puts that snake into Raj's office drawer, you know? And of course, Raj's reaction was entirely different. What was Sheldon's response? I tried to scare an Indian with a snake. What was I thinking, you know? You're better than that, it's kind of cool, okay. So what might be perceived by one particular person as a threat or as a demand may not be perceived in the same way by others. So you notice interpretation becomes critical here. And it's gonna be interpretation of a variety of things. It's going to be interpretation of the stimulus itself, whether that even represents, whether that even for a particular individual should be considered as a stimulus for the stress reaction. It may simply be for that particular individual an insignificant element of the environment, where for other individuals it might be huge, huge. So for example, criminal background investigation when you're going to be applying for a job. For many people, no big deal. For other people, deal breaker. And for other people, major, major uncertainty. Right? Three very, very different reactions, three, three very different interpretations based upon probably the life and legal history of the individuals who are involved. Right? Now, let's just stay right here. Let's assume that we're talking about a, a stimulus that is perceived as a demand upon the individual, a significant one, a threat, it's going to lead to some kind of response, but even now, the, the response that's likely will also, again, be mediated by the interpretation of the individual. So, for example, 
<clears throat> Here we talk about resources. Now resources can have an immediate, let's say an, an, an objective impact upon the relationship of the stressor to various options that are available to the individual. But the interpretation of the individual as to the availability, suitability of those kind of resources is also key. So let's say that you as a supervisor are making yourself available to one of the employees that you supervise and that person you're charging with an important task. That task is seen as a demand by them and one that perhaps they're not certain that they can meet to your satisfaction. Right. Do they see you as available? You've made yourself available. You've said that you're available. Do they see that as simply a polite way of ending the conversation? Where in fact they're really on their own? Do they see you as a colleague in this kind of thing? Somebody that can do the heavy lifting with them? Do they see you as judgmental? Do they see you as understanding? What's the impact that's going to be in terms of their performance evaluation, career opportunities, or whatever. All of those kind of things come into play in terms of the interpretation of whether the resources that you offer are unconditional, conditional, or actually largely absent. What's their interpretation of their own abilities? We tend to think of resources as external to the other or to the self, but in fact many of the resources we have in our profession are things that we we have right up here or right here, right? So the intelligence, the energy that you bring, the experience base, the skill sets that you have. So the person's own interpretation of self, if you will, comes into play in terms of the choices that they make about responses that are available to them. And the more you're familiar with this kind of stimulus or the more experience you have with these kind of things, the more that you have seen options available, the very inventory, if you will, of possible responses that are available to you at least become better aware. You're more aware of them, more available to you. So your own options increase. So what starts out looking like a fairly simple kind of causal model starts to become a bit more complicated when we start to break it down. Right? And it also, again, I want to bring this back, the stress reaction, while we can talk about the general adaptation syndrome as something that's, that for which we are genetically programmed, if you will, right, that in the actual event of a particular situation occurring, there can be so many different, or let's say variations, in terms of how people perceive the stimulus, what they perceive as being demanded of them, what they see as the resources internal and external available to them. The skills they actually have, not just perceptions, but the honest and goodness skills they actually have and the knowledge they have a variety of uh, responses, all highly variable. Here's a model <coughs> that begins to locate this in a more um, contextual way with any organization. So here we're talking about uh, a model of organizational stress, looking at potential sources of this and breaking it down between or among environmental factors, organizational factors, and individual factors. Acknowledging that there are individual differences involved in this, and among individual differences, we're also going to have a variety of interpretations that are available. The experience of stress itself, and then in the long run, the physiological, psychological, behavioral symptoms of uh, a stress reaction. Let's take a look at what each of those cells contains according to this model. And again, this is just one of many. Not, you, know, you don't need to memorize one of these things, but to get a, an understanding of the general content, at least for our purposes right now, would be uh, sufficient. Environmental factors would include things like economic uncertainty, uh, political uncertainties, and technological uncertainties. Uh, deal for a second with technological uncertainty. Can you imagine being, let's say, working in a mental health unit and you are a superb psychoanalyst? 
not that you necessarily be taught that here, but there are a number of schools and there are professions, for example, psychiatry, where psychoanalysis has been the, the bread and butter technology. Only to have uh, research come out and a new director come along and grant funding for you to be involved in cognitive behavioral therapy and those particular approaches to a client population. You know, cognitive behavioral therapy is a far piece away from psychoanalysis in terms of uh, underlying assumptions, in terms of uh, the uh, roles, responsibilities of the therapist, in terms of time frame, what is expected of the client, the process. Yeah, it's mental health, it's psychotherapy, but they're far, far cousins. You've made your name, you've built your self-identity to a considerable extent, you've built much of your self-worth around your skills, considerable skills, and uh, notoriety as a psychoanalyst, all right? And now you're gonna be expected to be engaged in cognitive behavioral therapy. Would you, would you perceive that as a threat or as a loss? I would suspect that I would. I would suspect that I would. And I would be wondering about my competitors who's out there that might replace me as um, um, a shining example of a star practitioner within the agency. Technological uncertainty, can you imagine what that's like in a lot of the high tech industries where you can you know, just really make a fortune in a short period of time or really make a reputation only to have some new revolutionary technology come along that far outstrips the capability and the potential that the technology commands that you mastered. Lots of uncertainty with regard to technological changes, et cetera. Organizational factors include things like the demands of the tasks that people are required to uh, or expected to meet, what their role demands are, interpersonal relationships and interpersonal demands. Do you ever have to work for somebody that you really didn't like as an immediate supervisor? Oh, let's see. <laughs> Almost universal. Okay, yeah, yeah. I can remember working for somebody who was really, really intelligent. Very, the person would have been wonderful if he had been a decent individual. Uh, but he was a bully. He was a bully. And, and the thing that when he was finally pushed out of his, his, his position, the thing I remembered the most as a noxious element in that relationship was the requirement that I would have to laugh at his jokes to maintain a relationship so that we could get resources that we needed for the department that I supervised. Yeah. That was the thing that stuck in my crawl. Yeah, interpersonal demands. Okay. What organizational structure, I've just talked about an interpersonal demand that was in the context of organizational structure and also organizational leadership. Also here this notion of organizational life stage which is something that we haven't dealt with too much in this class except to say that just as people go through life stages and its groups go through life stages. If you look back, you'll see that you have a handout on organizational life stages as well. We may have talked about that just briefly. And then there are individual factors here as we're talking about potential sources of, of stress, stressors, um, things like family problems and family demands. Remember that it's Freud who many, many years ago talked in terms of mental health as the ability to love well and the ability to work well. And for some interesting reason, we in our culture have forgotten Freud's earlier attention to the demands of work. And we focused on the capacity to love and maintain relationships here. Why am I bringing this up? Because as we've mentioned before, when people come to work, they don't leave their private selves at home. The private selves come along with them. So the problems, that they're having at home, they carry with them to work. Now, as we remember about the notion about nested identities, it may mean that in the process of driving to work and of putting on that other identity, which may not happen on the drive to work, it may not happen until you open the door and step into a building and then have to become kind of publicly another person, put that new identity on. And with that new identity, there may be an opportunity to distance oneself from the demands and the challenges and the stressors at home, but they're still with you, as we know. Oh yeah, and when you go home at night, I mean, how many of you ever gone home and the dog runs up to lick you and you kick the dog? You know, displacement. 
or you shout at the wife or the kids or the husband or something like that because you had a bad day at work. It's, it's human nature, but unfortunately the notion here is you, we take our families with us psychologically and emotionally at work, we take our work back with us to home. Economic problems, economic <laughs> pressures of the family, particularly against the context of what we see the, happening in the world economy right now, and people's own personalities. Some people create by virtue of the personality structure that they have. <coughs> Uh, more problems than they really have to. Other people, uh, more adept or more positive, kind of walk around in a semi-cocoon protecting them from a number of the problems that perhaps others experience. Oops. <coughs> what are some of the mediating factors there among individual differences? Uh, perception, interpretation. Uh, the job experience, the, what you bring to the situation. So your own objective, objectively measured array of skills and your own subjective uh, level of confidence and your own uh, uh, definition of yourself and the level of competence that you bring. The amount of social support that you perceive yourself as having is particularly critical. Oh, by the way, interesting thing here. Some of the research will show that, for example, if we're talking about a marriage and having marital problems, Having social support can be a very important moderator of the level of stress that you experience. Right. Having some pro uh, interpersonal problems <coughs> in, in other arenas. Social support can be very, very important in moderating the level of stress that you experience. At work, at work. Social support has not been shown to have the same level of moderating. That would, in our notion, would be a positive, healthful influence in reducing stressors or the experience of stress in response to stressors. And part of the belief there is that organizations, given the intended hierarchy that exists, policies, procedures, sunk costs, in terms of technologies, standard operating procedures, et cetera, th that the stressors are simply not that avoidable. They're, they're not as malleable, perhaps. Uh, and therefore, even the availability of social support doesn't provide some of the advantages that it does in the less formal arenas of life. The belief in locus of control. What's locus of control? Yeah, whether you're in charge of your own life or whether you're a pawn, uh, being pinged and ponged around, if you will, by uh, external forces. <clears throat> Who's likely to be able to uh, uh, adapt in more healthful, probably more satisfactory, responsive ways to stressors? Somebody with a higher locus, internal locus of control or somebody with a lower internal locus of control? Yeah, higher locus of control. So it's that sense that I am in charge of my life. I can take control over these events. At the very least, if I can't control external events, I can control me. <coughs> those kinds of perceptions, those kinds of beliefs, positively related with, with moderating the responses, extraordinary or extreme responses to, uh, to stressors. And then the level of hostility that people have, uh, that they carry with them or that they bring to a situation. What are some of those psychological, or excuse me, some of those consequences? <coughs> now, we're all talking now about stress now. Well, in terms of the physiological ones, we've already spoken to those. In terms of headaches, high blood pressure, could be bad cholesterol, heart disease, psychological symptoms, just the beginning of an array, including anxiety, depression, decreases in job satisfaction. Behavioral symptoms, including the loss of productivity at work, Increased absenteeism, turnover, greater likelihood for interpersonal discord. We'll talk about a variety of others a little bit later in, in the hour. And so now when you think about those different things, this is the same, this is the same model that we earlier looked at. But now you can put those other factors in here and to kind of get an idea of how that fleshes out.
partly by way of review, partly by way of an elaboration, an identification of a number of extra organizational stressors that do have relevance for the world of work. They do have relevance uh, in terms of our understanding of humans in the organization. Um, the stressors that, that come from family, uh, spouses or significant others, children, aging parents, the health issues that are related with them, um, <coughs> children. Do I need to say anything more? Wow. Um, I'll just tell you, we just last week, we just went through an event with our youngest, uh, who's 21. And um, did you ever get, we were just praying at home that, that it was just drug use, that it was just drug abuse. That's, that's, we were, we were. Uh, I just hope it's drug abuse. I just hope it's drug abuse. You know, it's kind of thing. And, and it turns out, have you ever heard of a hypnagogic hallucination? Yes. You know what those things are? It's, it's a hallucination you have as you are falling to sleep or as you are waking up. Mm -hmm. And they're very real mm -hmm. and Mm hmm mm hmm Yeah. And so what it turns out apparently is that our daughter experienced this, this really significant <laughs> hypnagogic uh, hallucination. Um, and then uh, as a result of that, couldn't get back to sleep, was up all night uh, in terror as a result of the, uh, of the hallucination, um, and then began to experience some visual hallucinations later on. Visual hallucinations when you're fatigued and when you're stressed, under stress, are really quite common. But she interpreted it differently, not knowing what was going on. And so what we were doing with, well, was it, is, it, is it a brain tumor? Is it a brain tumor? You know, is it is some kind of psychotic reaction? This kind of thing. So after CT scans and blood work and all this kind of stuff, it was, oh, it was probably <coughs> hypnagogic hallucinations and fatigue. But they don't really know what caused it, do they? It's, um, about what, visual hallucinations or hypnagogic hallucinations? Hypnagogic hallucinations are very, very common. They're not, I mean, they're, they're not atypical. And chances are, has anybody ever had a hallucination? I hope that this is interesting <laughs> to you who watch this. You know, anybody had a hypnagogic hallucination in your life? Just three of us? While you're waking, does that mean while you're It could be while you're waking or while you're falling asleep, yeah. It's, 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 it's in that, when you're in that intermediate period of time. There you go, now, now we're getting some more. <laughs> yeah. You know, and then if we would add to that, how about anybody have a, a hallucinations when you've really been tired or when you've really been under stress, you know? It, that's the thing, is that they're really, really quite common. And, and if you don't know that and you realize that you just had a hallucination, you might interpret yourself, interpret the event as, as kind of a, a beginning of a psychotic break or something like that. When in fact, it's really a very common experience. Really common experience. What's that? Yeah. Uh, Texas. Oh my goodness. So you all were here and she was there and you all were trying to figure out what was going on. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And my poor wife was experiencing tremendous stress and I'm thinking, I'm glad I'm here. I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> you know? Oh, it was really stressful. It really was stressful. Fortunately, it didn't last for me for 24 hours or so, but my goodness gracious. Real quick hypnagogic hallucination story it happened when I was in high school. Mansfield, Ohio. Mansfield, Ohio. Sleep, getting ready to go to sleep, look across and you know, midnight or something like that. I'm across my bedroom and I saw a cougar. And the cougar was uh, on my dresser looking at me. You know how a cat's tail will do that switch just before they leap? That's what it was doing. And I thought, <gasps> and I thought, wait a minute. And this is going through the process, Mansfield, Ohio, Richland County. We don't even have a frugging zoo. <laughs> and I said to the thing, I said, you're, you're just an hallucination. You're not here. And the thing just evap evaporated, just like that. It was so cool. It really was pretty cool. So is that the same thing as like truck drivers experience that whole thing about the black dogs, where they're driving for hours and hours and hours and they see something and it's not No, there. no, the black dog really exists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it probably is. It probably is. Okay. Relocation is such an important thing uh, for families and for workers. Now, it's probably, in some respects, maybe slowed down a little bit with the economy. 
or, or maybe it's only slowed down for some as other people try to m rush to where jobs are available. But at, for a long period of time, one could expect in this country to move every five years stati st statistically. And when we're talking about that, we're talking about generally people moving for school or moving for employment. If you're moving for employment, that generally means you're picking up the other members of your family along with you. You're, you're moving as a family unit. It means pulling kids out of school, pulling kids out of the relationships that they have with their friends. Um, and many of us have had to go through that kind of thing one way or another as parent or as child. Very, very stressful. It takes a long time for some people to settle in to begin to feel a part of the network around them. Financial and economic uh, pressures upon people. Uh, very, very much a part of our career field. Very much a part of our profession because we're not one of the better paid professions out there. And uh, problems in terms of, of residents, and that could be uh, um, the neighbors one has, the uh, homeowners association, uh, the neighborhood in which you're living, whether you're living in an urban environment, a rural environment, or whatever. Now, as we look at these levels now, these different organizational variables we're about to, I want to call your attention to a variety of kind of labels, <laughs> levels, or types of organizational variables. Um, there are special relevance with regard to stressors and stress. So intrinsic job factors. Think back to when we were talking about Herzberg and the difference between the motivators and the hygiene factors, and which, which were the constellation of motivators? Did, was that mostly <coughs> intrinsic factors or extrinsic factors? Motivators. Intrinsic. Intrinsic, that's right. Like challenge, uh, uh, task identity for the job, sense of completion, uh, task significance, things like that. Organizational structure and control mechanisms, another very important family of variables here. Reward systems, the human resource system, and the leadership within organizations. You'll notice these, these kinds of variables presenting themselves again and again now in what we're going to be talking about here. Here are a variety of sources of or organizational stressors. And Madison and Ivancevich, psychologists who are studying uh, organizational stress, make an important point, and that is that it's at the individual organization inter interface, the interactions between individual and organization that we see a major determinant of stress, actually major determinants of stress. So think back to our prismatic organizational model here. And remember how we started the very focused look at organizations? We looked at organizations qua individuals. This is where you'll see many of the variables popping up here. So what are some of these stressors? We're just going to list them. You've got the list in front of you. For the most part, much of this is just common sense once you've identified what the, the variable is. The physical environment can be an important stressor. And some people refer to this as blue collar stressors. It can be a stressor for us in social work. Sometimes it's that the it's well, sometimes it's the physical environment. Most of the time for us, uh, if there's an environmental stressor uh, in this sense, it's probably a threat from an individual rather than a threat from a hard physical environmental condition. But can you imagine people who are working high up on telephone poles or or uh, uh, towers or whatever? Uh, people who are working down in the coal mines, uh, for example, particularly after there'll be, let's say, an accident anywhere, your awareness of how precarious safety can be down there uh, really at the forefront. So physical environmental stressors can be an important thing. For most folks uh, in the white collar industries, those are not the case, and in professions are not the case, but we can be talking about job design. And here, variety of the tasks that you're uh, required to do. The level of autonomy and amount of autonomy you have, as it relates to the amount of autonomy that you prefer, that's a very important variable, because some people will not want that autonomy. They will see that as a threat itself, whereas other people will find autonomy to be precious and valuable. The level of task identity, the timing and nature of performance feedback that one gets, the amount of task significance all an important feature of job design. So 
maximize these different kind of variables here in terms of what you would prefer and you're probably looking at a kind of a job that would be designed that for you would be minimally stressful or if it's a stressor it's the kind of positive challenge that you're looking for for growth you're going to be experiencing the stress reaction as you stress now switch it around switch it around for each one of these things think of the opposite dimension the opposite kind of loading that you would prefer and think about how terrible that particular job would likely to be for you and how much of a stressor that could be all right and then remember this is just an exercise take a deep breath but as we go through this, what I also want you to do, right, kind of keep a mental note in terms of the job that you have or the job that you had or the internship experience that you've just had and check that off if you would. Is that something that for you, you perceived as a significant stressor while you were in that particular position? Okay. Do that for each one of these things. <coughs> Role conflict. Do, do you have different roles in a part of your job that actually are inconsistent with one another, particularly if there may be inconsistent with values that you have as well? Role ambiguity, uncertainty in terms of how you're actually supposed to be, perform on the job uh, in a particular task, what you're expected to do. Are you familiar with this one? Work overload? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Inadequate career development opportunities. If you've ever left a position because there was no ladder for you or that there was a minimal kind of access to whatever ladder existed for you. Have you ever been a part of an organization where the culture was noxious for you or to you? Leadership relations. And by leadership relations, it doesn't have to be the top executive that we're talking about your supervisor. That's where leadership actually starts. Your supervisor, your manager, the person that writes your performance evaluation. What's the nature of the relationship that you have with that individual? Lack of performance feedback. Except maybe once a year when there are a bunch of surprises that come, come your way. What can you do about improving individual organizational relationships? Well, the psychological contra contract, a concept we've talked about a number of times, is critical here. Honesty is critical in communicating the nature of the position, the nature of the organization, the role, the role expectations that somebody's going to have as your developing a relationship as you're hiring somebody and you're beginning to recruit them into the into the job right do people have an escape clause as part of that psychological contract right do people have thought out plan b if they realize that the plan a which is here isn't working lots of people don't that can become a major problem any kind of significant move will generally involve loss. It will generally involve burning some bridges. So for many people, the return to the status quo ante and some kind of equilibrium simply isn't available to them. That can be a source of stress. When recruiting and selecting individuals, this speaks to the importance of realistic previews of organizational expectations, conditions, resources, rewards, challenges, etc. Why recruit the very, very best person you possibly could if in order to recruit that individual you're lying or distorting the reality of the position, the reality of the organizational role? Right? Even if the person stays, they're likely to feel, um, what, somewhat alienated, distrustful, uh, uh, resentful, and maybe they move on and now you're involved in having to repeat uh, and invest all those considerable expenses again in recruiting another individual and did you learn from the first opportunity first experience I hope you did because if you continue to distort the information in order to get the best candidate you possibly can you're probably creating a revolving door 
with the second person leaving as well. Right. Matching candidates, needs, attitudes, and values with those of the organization can become a real important challenge here. And doing so in such a way that you don't violate fair labor practices with regard to hiring, for example. Here's the notion of knowing what your own organization is, what its culture is, how you do your things, and then trying to communicate that to individuals so that people who look for that or can work within those kind of contexts can communicate their preferences to you. In an effort at matching person's qualities with quality of the, of the organization. Socializing and mentoring people can become very, very important here. Now, a number of people have differentiated between getting in, which is before one actually gets to the position. This is the hiring process, if you will. Breaking in, which is the newly arrived individual at the organization. And here, someone being oriented and trained, provided with feedback early on. And settling in. This is negotiating relationships with work groups, balancing work and non-work responsibilities and obligations over time. With regard to getting in, because this occurs before an individual actually even shows up as a permanent member of the workforce, one of the suggestions here might be providing a communication conduit to help the new individual become aware of what's going on in the world of work that they're about to become a member of so that they're aware of who some of the major people are who are some of the major what are some of the major issues etc right so when they show up it's not everything is alien to them and getting the word out about the individual is, is also helpful with regard to that career planning can be very very important and career planning isn't particularly well done in uh, uh, human services field some individuals have differentiated between inactive, reactive, what's called preactive, and interactive. Inactive is essentially no career planning. Right? Doesn't exist. Reactive is simply taking advantage of opportunities when they come along, but without really seeking them out, without really exploiting the opportunities that are available uh, or, or preparing for them, simply going into uh, action mode uh, when things finally occur. Preactive is that notion of anticipating opportunities, preparing yourself for those opportunities, and then taking advantage of them when they occur, and being selective with regard to those various opportunities. Interactive is the, the real key to reducing stress here. It's doing all the preactive stuff, planning for your career, looking at options, preparing for options, marketing yourself, engaging, taking action when the opportunity occurs, but having a plan B in mind. When this doesn't work out, as some things are not going to work out, what's going to be my next option here? What am I going to do then? That's the key. Okay. Developing workforce policies that are pro-human, that are sensitive to stress and stressors, uh, encouraging participative goal setting with people tends to reduce experience of stress. Participative decision making likewise reduces the perception of stressors and stress. Job enrichment policies, and we've talked about job enrichment in here and what those various um, uh, options entail. Uh, attention to work scheduling. This is particularly with, uh, with regard to shift work. Uh, shift work can be uh, uh, a major stressor upon individuals. Uh, and we're talking here about people who are working night shifts, or we're talking about late shifts, or we're talking about any kind of shift work that might involve significant separations from significant others in their lives. Uh, can be a major uh, uh, stressor. There are folks who have rotating shift work, so that sometimes they might be on first shift uh, two, for two weeks, and then they're on second shift for two weeks, and third week, uh, third uh, uh, period of time, they're on their third shift, and then they're back to first. That, just terrible, just terrible. 
Flex time is an important uh, thing for organizations to consider to help people manage their lives and still get their work done. The whole issue of synchronous versus asynchronous expectations. If work is to be done, must it be done between 8 and 5 or 8 and 4.30? Is it possible to schedule work in such a way that people are held accountable for work performance, let's say twice in a week, uh, Wednesday at uh, 5 o'clock and, uh, I don't know, Saturday at 3. I don't care what the hours are. The, fo the, the notion here is that people get to work uh, when and how it's important for them to do so. Now, if you're talking about group work, that's not going to be particularly uh, um, uh, available for folks. You've got to be able to do group work for the most part in a group context. If you're talking about assembly line work, that's not going to be happening. But if you're talking about work that has high task autonomy, <coughs> if you're talking about work that many professionals do, this is the kind of thing that's a possibility here. Telecommuting as a way of managing the demands that are made upon people to be at work but also to negotiate distances and perhaps distances crowded and made more complicated by uh, thousands and thousands or millions and millions of other people on the highway at the same time that you would be expected to be there. The development and, and the availability of employee assistance programs, either internal or external, which is to say either sponsored by the company or contracted through some other provider, either for-profit or not-for-profit, but making clinical services available for people, case management services available for people, stress reduction, health promotion activities available for people, and a variety of other kinds of services. Does the organization have a stress management and stress prevention program? Do they promote these kind of things? Okay. Let's take a break at this point in time. We'll come back before you experience burnout, and then we'll talk about burnout for a little bit, and then we'll have a final kind of wrap-up.